going to uh, be seated. I got a quick video for you of our updated prison ministry, and uh, and then we'll dive right into today's uh, teaching. In John chapter four. Uh, verse. I'm going to read the end of the story. This is about the woman at the well, okay? If you haven't heard this, this is going to be all new for you. If you have heard this, I'm going to teach you things you've never heard or known before, okay? So when we look in this, the woman at the well, Jesus meets the woman at the well, and we'll talk all about that, but then she goes and witnesses to the whole town. The whole town comes out, and that's where I want to read with you. This is the longest conversation recorded with anyone that Jesus had. Hear me. This is the longest conversation recorded that Jesus had with anyone, with any one individual, and it was with a woman at the well. Okay? So verse 39, it says, And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. Can I get a testifier in this place? Hallelujah. If you don't know what that means, that means you just get excited and start clapping. Hallelujah. You get that Holy Spirit fire shut up in your bones and you get excited. Uh, uh, and testified, and then it says after that, it says after she testified, he told me all that I had ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed another two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Let me just tell you, it did not say all. And I need this to be just a rejoicing moment for anybody who's ever invited somebody to church and they didn't like church. These guys were sitting in front of Jesus and they still, not all, but many. And so sometimes you're going to invite somebody to church and be like, I don't like the way they do that. And they might not like it. That's okay. You're not here to please them. You're here to please God. And you're going to bring people to Jesus. It's the old saying, lead a horse to water. You can't make them drink. I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to take your free will away to tell you to choose. You get to choose. You get to decide whether you're going to let down your guard or not. Whether you're going to let down that pessimism, that doubt, that insecurity, that pride. I know there are some right now, I could feel it in my heart. There is doubt in your mind right now about whether or not this is real. I'm here to tell you, I, I'm trying to even pinpoint who you are. There, 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 there's doubt, but let me tell you, that's where the Bible says, Lord, I have doubt, but help me with my unbelief. If you can be willing enough to just simply say that, God will meet you right where you are, okay? So then it says this. It says, then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard, and we know that this indeed, the Christ, the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you, God, that we're here today, not on what somebody else said, but what you're about to say in our life. Not about what we understand, but what we experience and who you are in our life. And I thank you. Somebody's going to walk away today saying, I experienced Jesus. It wasn't mama who told me. It wasn't dad who made me. It wasn't grandmama who forced me. It was me experiencing who Jesus is in my life that made the greatest point of transformation for my life, that that moment became a movement that I kept with me forever. And I thank you, Lord, that a miracle's about to take place today where somebody's going to experience who Jesus is in a very tangible and real way. In Jesus' name, everybody who's ready gave God a big praise and an amen. You may be seated. Turn to your neighbor that you like and say, you are significant. And watch these screens. we got a quick video update. Yeah, you saw those other church guys around the tank from the bridge church? That's my security, so none of them drown me in there. No, I'm just kidding. I tell them every time, like, y'all better play nice while we're in this water. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's incredible. What you're seeing, so let me explain that. that. That's part of our prison ministry. That was just the last visit we had. Um, God opened the door, and uh, we all not only got into a prison, but now uh, the director for all the uh, prisons in the state of Arizona 
Oh, they all have a reentry program that help people going in from 10, 15, 30, how many years they've been in, get back into society in a healthy way. And so it's Pima, it's Lewis with Second Chance, it's MRC, it's the one in Tucson. So all of those prisons now, because of our last visit, she said, I love what Bridge Church is doing so much. I want you guys in every prison in the state of Arizona. And so that's happening this month. <clears throat> so wonderful. So now again, to kind of give you a picture, if you don't know a lot about prison, like me, I had to get it explained to me. And what happens is when you come out, when you're, when you're doing a long stint or anything like that, a lot of times what they're going to do is going to support you with classes and structure and uh, help to, to get you back on your feet. Uh, a lot of times it's not going to be in the private side of the prisons because uh, unfortunately, the private side of prisons, there are a private side, not a federal and state side. The private side is more about the recidivism, about the retention repeat customers, you all understand? And they want that happening. They're okay with that. So they're not really going to prepare them as much. Um, not all, some do want that. Not all want that. And so these private prisons are not really setting them up for success. And now our government, in fact, our governor, Governor Ducey has asked me to be on the goal council that happened a couple years ago. And now we're helping reduce recidivism in the whole state for all the prisons in the state of Arizona. And part of the goal is in these places, these reentry centers, is they're 60 to 90 days from being released. So they're going through all of these things to get certified about getting knowledge about housing and jobs and transportation and all that. Well, the other big piece of that is their faith. Uh, the warden said, oh no. The director said, no, we need Jesus in their life. These classes will help. Jesus will make the biggest difference. Will you please come to all these prisons? So that's what's happened uh, for us to be a part of this process and really seeing, we've seen over a thousand and men give their life to Jesus uh, and, and get baptized and incredible. And I say all that to not only give you an update, but what we're going to do in this next year, one full year, uh, is, is we're going to visit, and with all the prisons opening up, we're going to visit another thousand. And so what we've decided to do is give people an opportunity to help sponsor an inmate. And what that does is puts a Bible in their hand, because we're not always able to take and do everything. Uh, just it costs a lot. Gas is higher, uh, bringing the baptismal tank, worship team, preach, everything. It, 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 everything costs, okay? And then to do something fun like bring Chick-fil-A so they like what we're about to do or or ice cream, you know, and you buy, get on their good side, you know, and, and treat them and bless them well. Let them know you're not animals, you're people. And so uh, really re-entering them into a name rather than a number uh, is what they've been known for. So what we're, what we're doing is we're bringing the most important message, and you can sponsor an inmate for 50 bucks, and our goal is to get 1,000 inmates sponsored. And so they're going to get a Bible and they're going to get a significant book. So the most important message is getting the word of Jesus in their life and then finding out that they're worth something significant, they're valuable, and how to discover, define, and direct that. Yeah, we can give God a praise. We'll do it. We'll get it done. So I'm taking this, and when I do my book tour in the fall, uh, we're going and we're going tonight to do our, our Phoenix location. Next week, I'll be at our Lake Havasu location and, and just and encouraging them to be a part of this process as well. Uh, and then we'll be taking the book everywhere uh, from there to Florida to California and really encouraging people to help to sponsor some inmates and let's see some lives changed and be a part of the ministry that God has gifted and favored Bridge Church with. Uh, so right now, let's dive right into the scripture, John chapter 4. Um, Josh, do you have that scripture? You have it in the New King James Version? You have your sultry Josh voice ready? Don't do the high pitch notes. No one can sing along with you. When you when you do the low pitch notes, that's when all of a sudden everybody starts, yeah, you get that deep register. No one can hit those high notes that you do. So give us the deep voice. Give us a test. Go ahead, test. Hey, hey there you go. Okay, good. Testing, <laughs> testing. I've been doing this thing where I let somebody else read the scripture lately, and I kind of like it. So uh, we're going to go in here. The title of the message, we're on a significant series, so just write that down. We're an amening church, we're a hallelujah church, we're a clapping church, and we're a note-taking church because we take what God is saying to us seriously. So take a pen and paper in front of you, uh, pull out your phones. Uh, everybody should have a notebook on their phone unless... I don't know where, what rock you may have been living under, but get, get a phone out, get something out, take good notes. And we're going to go through this and we're just going to pull out the truth that God has for us today in this particular service. Okay. Um, so let's go to John chapter four, the woman at the well, and let's start in verse four. But he needed to go through Samaria. Stop. Okay. You know me. Point number one. Here we go. I want you to write this down. Significant direction. Okay. 
significant. Well, he, the, listen, he had baptized a lot of people, and there was a lot of baptism happening, and the Pharisees were mad about it. Uh, everybody's going to be fine with you talking about Jesus. No one, uh, people will start getting upset when people start converting to Jesus. Everybody knows that Jesus was a man historically. Some people say that Jesus is a prophet. Not everybody will say Jesus is Lord. And when you start seeing, I'm telling you, I'm preaching to somebody who's a leader in this place. When you start seeing people turn their lives to Jesus and you're baptizing them, watch the rattlesnakes come out of nowhere because the Pharisees started chasing him. And then he said, I need, but I need to go. It wasn't easier. It wasn't convenient. He said, I need to go through Samaria. And this is the point for you and I, when you're on your journey of significance and understanding worth and value in your life, God is not going to take you where it's convenient. He's going to take you where conviction directs you. And conviction has become a curse word in the church. We don't want to feel convicted because we associate that with condemnation. Conviction is don't touch that fire. Condemnation is you idiot, you touch that fire. We're, we're not saying you idiot, you touch that fire. We're saying, hey, don't be careful. There ought to be a healthy conviction in your life. No, that's not a good friend to be around. No, that's not a right place to be in. No, that's not a right direction to go. And it's not always going to be easier. It's not easy to show up to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. But let me just tell you, a healthy conviction will get you in the right place with the right people at the right time. And when you got all that working for you, honey, there ain't nothing in heaven or hell that can stop you from living out your purpose on this earth. Oh yeah, I'll preach it before I preach it. This is better than your amen. -ing. I know we're warming up. But significant direction is huge because we want to take the road most traveled. We want to take the road that's obvious. We talked a lot about this last week, significant way. So I'm not going to harp on this, but we need to understand that when, as God's calling you out, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're, you're supposed to be consecrated to the Lord. And when you are consecrated to the Lord, it's going to be a direction that not everybody goes. And everybody's cool with you as, as long as you stay where they met you. But when you start taking roads that no one else takes and you start taking roads that they would never take and you start going higher than no one else has gone before but in your family, your friends, in your circle, that's when people have a problem with you. Because it, it, I, I'm fine with you as long as you stay at the level I met you at. You're, you're cool. I like Anybody ever experienced this in their life? Or am I preaching to somebody who hasn't lived a life yet? When you experience life enough, you're experiencing a, a, a tremendous success or favor or grace of God in your life. Not everybody wants to hear about your promotion. Not everybody wants to cheer you on about your raise. Not everybody wants to be, but you're going to have those people who are just there to hate on you and chase after. That's what Jesus was. So he said, I need to go through Samaria. And he was going through Samaria just like he was going to gatherings. He went for one person. And I mentioned it earlier. He talked to this one person, this Samaritan woman, not a Jew, just like he did with the man in gatherings. And he had one person he came in contact with, got in the boat and left. And that one person in gatherings changed 10 providences. This one woman is going to change. I'm going to prove to you that you, you, uh, some things that you never, uh, never knew and thought and, and how she actually changed all of Italy and Rome. This woman changed a lot more than you think because we only read this story and we don't read how her life continued and the impact that she had. But I'll show you today. So let's keep reading. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Mm. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, asked a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For, G, uh, for Jews have no uh, dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Pause right there. I want you to write this next point down. Significant conversation. So when you step out and you're heading in the direction with the Lord and you're finding out value, you're discovering yours, you're going to impart it to others, and, and, and you're going to start encouraging others in their value and who they are in Christ, let me just tell you, you're going to have to have conversations, not conflict. And a lot of times the world that we live in right now is wanting to turn conversations into conflict, but we as believers are here to turn conflict into conversation where we can say, okay, I know you want to argue about this, but can we discuss this and get to a healthy point? And Jesus is going to have an incredible conversation, the longest 
recorded conversation in the Gospels with one individual and a woman, a Samaritan woman at that. So first off, anybody who preaches down about women, now women can't preach, women can't teach, women can't lead, ought to go back and say, Jesus, I think you messed up. Because right here, Jesus, along with Lydia and Mary and Mary and Martha, all those wonderful, incredible women of God changed thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. And it started with Jesus saying, I came to meet you at six o'clock. And Jesus showed up at the 930 service and said, you didn't come to church. You came to be the church. You came to, you didn't come to watch and be a voyeur and a spectator. I came to deliver a word for you because you got purpose in your life. You got length in your days and I got hope in your heart. And if you can hear what the Holy Spirit is going to download into your life today, day that he showed up right on time for you, you're going to hear a significant word in this healthy conversation. Now, this conversation may bring conviction, and that's a good thing. Don't resist conviction. Allow conviction to challenge you to change you. Because the first thing that she brought up was racial tension between the Samaritans and the Jews. Now, everybody take a deep breath. I'm not going to get into the racial discussion right now as much as some of you may want to. But let me just tell you, Jesus didn't either. When she brought this up, he, she wanted him to discuss the issue. He wanted to discuss the solution. And so she brought up the conflict. He brought up the conversation. And every time somebody wants to, now it's good. I don't want to dismiss having knowledge and understanding and and wisdom and having tactfulness. The Bible says be prepared in season and out of season with an answer when those who come to you asking questions and you ought to have the answer. But the answer isn't maybe what your mind tells you. It's what your spirit tells you and your spirit is telling you Jesus is the answer. He is the solution for our life. We all want to continue to talk about the issue, but Jesus is saying we got to talk about the solution because just talking about the issue will never bring the healing, but the solution, the answer Jesus in your life will bring the healing that you need in your life. I need somebody to get ready to hear this message right now because our world is dealing with massive conflict right now and all we want to do is show up with our picket signs. Oh, here we go. Here And, and, and listen, he's going to talk about, she's going she's to continue to uh, uh, attack him. She's going to continue to try to belittle him. She's going to try to bring up religious stuff. She's going to try, and he keeps directing it back to, I'm the living well. I'm the water. I'm the life. And he keeps bringing it back to what the answer is in the healing place in her life. And he keeps bringing it back. But Christians, I want to talk, I'm not talking about the world. He first has to get himself and her before he can heal or do anything. And so what he does is he does the opposite of what a lot of Christian churches are doing. I want to go out with my picket sign and tell you you're going to hell if you're getting abortion. And we're just going to pick it and 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 pick it. And, pick it and, G and listen, discussing the issue won't get you very far. But telling them the answer, I'd rather you just say, Jesus loves you. Free hugs over here, bro. Whatever you got to do to say, you know what? Jesus is the focus, not your issue, not your pain, not your problem. We are making the pain the point instead of the promise, the point. If you start making the promise of what God has for somebody, the point of the conversation, all of a sudden the pain will get dealt with. Because listen, we're all trying to heal a pain and you're not the healer. We are simply just, hey, that's Jesus. He's the only one who could do it. Can we just point to him? Because I can't fix you. That's what pastors have to come to terms with. Y'all are way too jacked up for me to help. I can write a hundred books. I can write everything. I can't help y'all. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you can't be helped. No, no, no. And you're not the helper. It, we all are like, well, uh, you know, that's like the, we all see it in these dysfunctional, like, you know, uh, uh, relationships where she's like, but I can fix them. Right? If I just get him to church, Pastor Landon will make him live right. <laughs> no, I, that, is, that is the opposite of my job, number one, and I don't want to. But also, you can't do that. You're not going to fix anybody. And Jesus was sitting there saying, look, we can't talk about all your pain until you learn how to get me in your life. See, you're wanting to address an issue without having the solution first. And see, that's how we, in our mind we think we've got to have the other before the one. And so you, you got to have Jesus before you can start any kind of healing or reconciliation process. There's no point in having a conversation. The Bible says that the word of God is, is, is foolishness to those who are not a believer. It's just ridiculous. It's stupid. So why are you preaching godly morals and values to somebody who doesn't have Jesus? We're arguing a conversation. We will not win. 
And let me just tell you, that doesn't mean give up on morality or hope or godliness. It just means redirect the conversation to a healthy conviction, not more conflict. And so Jesus redirects this and he shapes it. And so then he continues. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. (laughs) Where then do you get that living water? Say no bucket. bucket. Come on, say no bucket. This dude ain't even came to a well. Don't even have no bucket. How are you going to get what? That's what she says right here. Keep going. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Now she insults him. Who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Yeah. Jesus answered and said to her. Listen, listen. It goes. He, she insults him. Right. She says, where's your bucket? Did he like, hey, I had a bucket at home. I was, I was tired. I couldn't bring it. My disciples are going to get a bucket. I have a bucket. Trust me. There's a bucket. There's a great bucket. He's got a bucket. She's got a bucket. They all got buckets. The buckets are on their way. He didn't address it. And then, he, then she insults him and says, what are you, more powerful? Are you greater? What do you think? You're better than us, right? She starts going after him. And then that's when he goes back again. Listen, this is going to be one of the most freeing things in your life for all you Facebook arguers. If you can learn how to re- do it like Jesus does, you will avoid a lot of frustrating days okay here we go and he says what josh whoever drinks of this water will thirst again but whoever drinks of the water that i shall give him will never thirst but the water that i shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life pause right there Okay, this is huge, okay? And, and, and this is a big point. Why? Because you see this beginning of the conversation where she's, he, she's trying to insult him, right? She's bringing, she brought up the racial tension. Now she says, are you greater? And, and, and then she says, you don't even have a bucket. And, and how are you going bu- to get any water if you don't even have a bucket? And then so there's all this conversation. And then he's like, if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. And so he's trying to show her and teach her. And I want you to write this point down. I'm going to show you significant source. When you know, that's what got the literal definition of G. OD means primary source of everything. When you understand the source of your life, you'll understand how to live your life. But what she was doing is she was living that bucket life like all of us live. A bucket was simply meant to go to a well. Let's talk about the practicality of it. I go to the well with my bucket. I pull water from the bu- from the well with my bucket. I go home with my bucket, and I use the water for that day for what I need. Does that make sense? So it's the bucket is for the immediate need for right then. But Jesus is saying you're living an immediate moment to moment need and a, and a pacified basis where you just pacify the need for now. But I can become the well in your life that you'll never run dry. You'll never be thirsty again. And the difference between the two is this: I know who my source is. So so instead of living a pacified life, I live a satisfied life. Because when the word of God comes in, the Holy Spirit comes into my life, I don't have to be pacified. Oh, there we go. Let me hit, did I hit a button? No, y'all know where I'm going. Oh, but if he just preached the way I like him to preach. If we just, hey, pastor, if you just let, tell a couple more jokes and just let us leave here just on a good note. I, this conviction stuff is, is way too heavy. Or, or oh, I don't like that song. If they just sing the way I like it or if they preach the way I like it, I wish the rows were a little different. I wish the air wasn't so chilly in here. My wife hates it when I turn the AC on. And, and um, I wish it was, the, we all want to pacify according to, our personal preferences. But listen, if you've never heard me teach this, personal preferences left unchecked become prejudice in your life, and it will rob you from the presence of God in every turn you make to try and and an effort to receive Jesus in your life because preferential things have kept you from letting your guard down and giving your bucket up and saying, I'm done being pacified. I want to be satisfied. I'm done you telling me what I want to hear, and I'm, I'm ready to hear what I need to hear in my life. I want to be challenged. I want to talk to a champion. I want to talk to some champions here and online who say, you know what? I'm not called for you to leave me at my lowest. See me that I can be better. Isn't that what we all want? Somebody to see like, no, you're not at your peak. Some, some of you older people said, hallelujah, right there. Anybody with gray hair ought to start praising the Lord. You're not at your peak. I got my, 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 Deidre calls it my Papa Joe patch, my little bald patch that's happening right back here that I cover up so perfectly. 
but I cover it up. Why? Because I don't want to get older. Why? Because I, I don't want to feel like I've reached it and now I'm, I'm balding. I'm older. I'm getting gray hair. I'm, my daughter is aging me every day. I feel like, oh, maybe this is it. Maybe the book, this is the time for Landon. It'll never get better. I don't know. Maybe I'll never have better jokes. I, I could easily, like, listen, age or, or a position in life could easily make you feel like, no, you're, you've capped your ceiling and, and you're never going to get better. It could have easily felt like that, hitting Flagstaff multiple services all filled and then all of a sudden God opens prison God opens doors God opens home churches and God opens all these locations around the United States and 135 churches that we have planted in four years and God says your best days are ahead of you you are a champion and I'm calling you to not feel like you have peaked but there is something greater for you and when you get fired up about about, about yourself enough You'll start feeling what the Holy, what God, what, what Jesus was trying to speak to this woman and saying, look, this is a significant moment in your life that you can let the bucket down. I, I, I would preach this whole message on this, this one point. We all love our bucket. You, you see, you come in here and you think you, you look good and you're playing the part and you, 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 you have the face or you have the, the feel, but really you're like, I, I could see you. You are clinging on to that bucket. And you're like, no, I love my bucket. This is my bucket. My bucket never leaves me. I just, this is, this is my safeguard. This is, and and, and, and you, we call, I call it a bucket, but you just call it just safe distance, boundaries. I'll only let somebody get so close. I'll only let my guard down so much. I'll only let a church in so far. I'll only let God in that. I, I, I can't let, I, I, this is my bucket. Why? Because I, I, I've tried to let it down before and it only hurt. And I've learned you've taught yourself. Life has taught you. You got to get your bucket. Get yours. Hustle, son. Get what you got to get. Don't, don't, don't worry about anybody else. Do your thing. Right? You got to take care of you. Nobody else is going to take care of you. So you've learned how to keep onto that bucket. Keep that bucket because no one else is going to fill you. No one else is going to help you. No one else is going to provide. No one else is going to protect. No one else is going to encourage. No one else is going to strengthen. And Jesus is showing up today to tell someone besides the woman at the well, give me your bucket life. Because if you're living the bucket life, you're not living the blessed life. If you're living the pacified life, you'll never live a satisfied life. That's why life always feels like it goes up and down. The Bible says that if you, if you understand who you are, there's a wellspring in you waiting to team forth. And, and he says, and your cup will overflow. Some of us are always at a half empty or just waiting to be refilled or empty again or all that. It's this up and down life. And let me just tell you, your cup can always be overflowing when you're in that satisfied lane. When you have a, a bucket mentality, You'll never live that blessed lifestyle, but you got to let go of it. Something up here, somebody just begin to, you know, just look at me like you, you like it's not you, but I want you, it's a moment of honesty between you and the Holy Spirit to say, you know what? I need to let my bucket down today. You're coming and going to church and listen, this is all you've taught yourself. I get what I need and I leave and I come and I go and I do what I want because only I know really what I need most. And Jesus is showing up to this woman at six o'clock. Can you imagine how he's just chill? I mean, this conversation, he's, I've just imagined him like cloak and hanging out by the well, and just being extra. And then he's just hanging out and all of a sudden she, and he just happens to be there at the exact time that she's coming to draw from that well. And he's saying, hey, can you give me some water? Let's talk a little bit. And that's how Jesus shows up in our life. He shows up when we, we didn't expect it. Oh, those significant, unexpected blessings. Anybody ever had those where Jesus shows up and it was midnight? It was in a car. It was at your house. It was in a service. And you, you didn't really expect it, but he showed up and he moved you in a way that, whew, at first it caused you to be tense and butterflies. And, and then you felt this moment where you're like, man, I can let my guard down. He really does love me. Josh, keep reading. I want to keep going. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that Woo! I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Now she's hungry. Now she wants it. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said. Time out. Just a point of conversation. It's just English, right? We're looking at this. It, the first part of this conversation was all about who he is. And now she wants more of this blessed life. And he says, Well, let's learn a little more about you too. And so every time you're going to get into a relationship with Jesus, some of you are fearful right now. 
and you think that this woman, you've, in fact, raise your hand if you've ever heard this passage of scripture before. Come on, raise your hand high. Look at all around. All, I'm about to show you some things you've never seen before. So this woman, this one, we all think she is about to get called out and Jesus is about to say, you know, yeah, you've been married five times and the one you're with, you're not even married to. And we all think she was an adulterer. She left her husband. She had done all these things. She was a sinful, shameful woman. But I could tell you, read the whole passage, read the whole chapter. Never once did Jesus say, you are forgiven of your sins. Go and sin no more. And let me tell you, if he knew there was sin in her life, it was an absolute necessity for him to forgive those sins. But he didn't say it once, but because of the culture after Christianity was birthed of women being demeaned and belittled, she could not be an influencer with an untainted record. So everybody made her out like Mary Magdalene to be this sinful, adulterous, terrible woman. And let me tell you, he wasn't calling out all the sin and shame. He said, I know you've walked through some pain and I know you've had husband after husband and they probably got rid of you because you couldn't have kids or they died on you and you're a widow, whatever it may be, but I'm seeing your pain. And Jesus, right in this moment, when if you can hear this, she, she's like, hey, now I want to know. And he's starting to say, hey, good. But a lot of us, when Jesus wants to know you, you think he's about to call out everything you did wrong. And Jesus isn't about to call out your problems. He's about to deal with your pain. And the biggest pain in her life was all the rejection that she experienced from five different husbands who kicked her out of their home because she wasn't good enough. Oh, can I preach to somebody that she wasn't enough. She didn't, couldn't do it or she wasn't the right wife or a good enough wife or a pretty wife. And so they got rid of her and Jesus shows up and says, I see your pain and I'm about to deal with all your pain because all these superficial fruit issues are not the root issue that I want to deal with. And so he says, Hey, I know you had five, but, and now you're working on number six. And, and I understand why you went through this. See, the church has been notorious for picking sides in a divorce, picking sides in pain, picking so sides in issues and problems and determining who was right and who was wrong. Church, body of Christ, can I compel every single believer? We cannot afford to pick who was right and who was wrong. We got to speak the solution. We got to speak Jesus. We got to speak healing. We got to talk to the pain. Everybody has pain, but it's how you deal with the pain. And you inflicting more pain does not help. I can prove it even further. We read about how she was a witness, right? We read that she went to the town and that all, the whole town came back, right? How? If she's a, a sinful, shameful, adulterous woman, number one, you weren't allowed to be around her. If she was, she's not a credible witness. But somehow, she is such a credible witness that the whole city came to see Jesus. See, some of you, you have discredited your value by saying where you didn't do it right or where life hit you the hardest. I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit sent me on an assignment today in this particular service to let you know that no matter what you came through, it doesn't define you or shape you. You came from God. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. And he said, no matter what kind of mistakes or pain you've ever experienced, I am the one who has set your days ahead of you and the rest of your days will be the blessing rest of your days because I am showing up right on time, six o'clock, right by the well. I knew you'd be here and I had to go through Samaria. See, this is, the, this, is, this is where the meat of this we get into here is the significant impact that Jesus has. And then I'm not, I don't have time to read all the scripture, but then the, the next point I want to give you as he's reshaping it is he changes her identity. So write that down, significant identity, because then she has to be honest with who she is. She goes, you're right. How many, if you got called out on the carpet for your stuff, you would be so cordial to be like, you know what? You're right, buddy. She said, you must be a prophet. Wow, that's really good. I could tell you one thing I know, and you don't have to say it. I've called some people out on their stuff, and they didn't like it. And it wasn't fun, and it wasn't a good conversation. It turned into a point of conflict, and I had to back off to let Jesus do the work in their life. And not every time do we, do we respond well to healthy truth, but the truth will set you free if you're ready to receive it. And Jesus speaks, he says, listen, I wanna bless you. I wanna give you this water. You just ask for the water, you ask for the well. I'm the well, I am the water. I can give you both, but I can't give you it while you continue to hide who you really are because I can't bless who you're pretending to be. 
And so this is, you've heard that quote before. A lot of churches quote that quote. This is where that passage comes from. God is trying to bless her, but he can't bless who she's faking. She can't, he can't bless who she's pretending to be. You got to be real. You got to be vulnerable. Some people say, oh, I like to, I'm transparent, pastor. I'm transparent. I'm just a glass house. Yeah, a glass house is okay. Uh, you could see into it, but you're not allowing anything to move or change in it. Vulnerability is the difference. Vulnerability is not only seeing, but allowing the change to take place too. I, I, anybody could be transparent. It takes real vulnerability to say, you know what? You can move stuff around too. You can, you can do something different in my life. You're right, that doesn't belong there. You're right, I am insecure. You're right, I am selfish. Come on, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is, you want, to, you want to change the world? Starts right here with being honest. Significant honesty will be the greatest key to your transformation. God can never bless what you're lying about pastors. We, we got to be honest in front of people. I can't get up here and then put on this, oh man, get my preacher voice on out here. And then I go hang out with you and I'm totally different. I'm the same here as I am at Collins guys. <laughs> I, I'm going to talk about Jesus. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to hang out with you. I'm not going to lie about who I, I remember pastors. They, they either would damn alcohol and drinking all that stuff, or they glorify and, and, and magnify. And let me just tell you, I, I, drinking is not the devil. I'll tell you, I have a drink every once in a while. Let me tell you why. Cause alcohol is not the problem. The abuser is the problem. So if you got a problem with alcohol, it's not that problem. It's your problem and you'll never change a problem you don't own. So when you start taking ownership of these issues, that's when you can say, you're right, I do have a relationship issue. Yeah, you're right, I do have an alcohol issue. Yeah, you're right, I do have an addiction issue. Yeah, you're right. And that's what all of a sudden she says, yeah, you're a prophet. Josh, let's continue from there when he talks about worshipers, real worshipers will arise. Because she says, you're, uh, she, uh, you know what, I'll just read it. Thank you, Josh. I got it, I'm right here. Let's see him. You're done. <laughs> Verse 19, it says, the woman said to him, sir, I have perceived that you are a prophet. Our prophets worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that I and Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming. Now, again, he does not bring, she's bringing up a religious tension. Which church is better? Which way of worship is right? And who's, who's right? Loud worship, quiet worship. Loud prayer, quiet prayer. Methodist, right? Pentecostal, Baptist, Lutheran. Who's right? And Jesus says, I'm not answering that question because that's not really the problem. And he says this, he says, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. That's huge. We know that we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, this is key, and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It means, listen, it means that I'm going to worship the Spirit, literally means His Spirit. With I'm going to worship in the Spirit of Jesus Christ on the earth. I'm going to worship in the Spirit. And truth means accordance to which God commanded. There are seven Hebrew words for worship. I do not have time to even tell you one. There are seven words for worship that God instituted, and He's saying this is what worship really is. In other words, if you're doing it how you want to, it's not worship. But if you're doing it how I commanded and taught you in my Spirit and in my truth, then it will be real worship. Worship. And that's what he's saying right here is there's going to be a day when we stop, we put aside what we think worship is, where we think worship is, what we think worship is, and we're going to worship God in spirit and truth according to what Jesus said worship is like, which means I got to worship not according to my feelings, but according to my faith. And when I worship, of course, that's why we clap at this church. Why? Because one of the words of worship is to clap your hands, extend your hands. Another word of worship is to kneel. Another word of worship is to stand and dance clamorously and foolishly. Another one is to sing like a choir. Another one is to sing by yourself. They all require a physical response. And that's why standing there silently watching worship cannot be called worship. Because one day real worship will take place. And this is what he's saying. It will be infectious. People will love it and understand that that's what real worship should be like, life-giving. And I don't have time to go into the rest. i got to close this. But the story continues, and he talks about real worship. 
And then she says, oh my goodness, hey, you know, like, wow, you're incredible. And he said, and, and she says, I know the Messiah is coming one day. And she's literally looking at Jesus, the Messiah. And she said, the Messiah is coming one day and he'll tell us all this stuff that you're trying to tell us. Thank you very much. And she tries to dismiss him and he says, I am he. I want you, if you have it in your Bible, underline that in your Bible. The other time that he says, I am, there was a whole troop of soldiers that were knocked to the ground. When he said, I am to this woman, every pain, every demonic oppression and possession over her life had to flee. Every healing that needed to take place fell to the ground. And Jesus did a magnificent, marvelous, mighty work in her life because all of a sudden we don't hear from her. She booked it. She went running. Woo! She took off. I scared y'all in the back. Oh, poor guy. You're doing really good, buddy, back here. I, I, and she took off right. We don't even hear from her. And then Jesus like kind of sets the table. He's like, hey guys, a harvest is coming. A harvest is coming. Harvest is coming. He knew what was about to happen. He knew she was going to go back and witness. And so then she goes back and witnesses and the whole city comes. And when the whole city comes, all of a sudden, wow, oh, many, we read it, many receive Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. I'm going to give you a name you've never heard before. Her name is Fotini, P-H-O-T-I-N-I. Her, this woman went on to not only minister to that whole city, but she got her family, she got her friends, and she said, let's go change the world. And she literally, Jesus left that moment, and she went on changing city after city. She became known as the mother of all evangelists. This, I want you to write this down, significant witness. Because your lead, if you want to be called a leader in the kingdom, your leadership can be measured by how many people you lead to Jesus. And I'll prove it to you. This woman goes out and she starts changing life after life after life. And, and, and you know what? Then she goes from there and she goes all the way to Rome and she starts battling a woman. In a day when a woman was less valuable than a child and almost equivalent to a dog. And she went and battled Caesar, Nero. And she says, oh no, Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. And she fought with all her family and her friends, and they tortured them. And she gave her life for Jesus. And she said, I'm not giving up. And she became one of the biggest evangelists in all of history because this woman had a significant witness inside of her that said, oh no, I can't keep what I've been receiving. I can't keep what's in me because she finally figured out it's too much for me to keep. That's how you know if you really got a conversion moment. When it's too much because it's just bubbling over you, you had a conversion moment. I can't help but want to share Jesus. That's why Peter became the head of the church, not because Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. Jesus was talking about the revelation that came through Peter. But Peter stood up after the day of Pentecost and he was fully received of the Holy Spirit and then he stood up and preached the message and 3,000 people were added to the church that day. Two days later, Peter was made the head of the church. You do the numbers. A, a little while later, Saul becomes Paul, and Saul starts ministering to tens of thousands of people, and all of a sudden, Paul becomes the head of the church. Your leadership will be measured in heaven by the amount of people you bring to Jesus. Not the amount that choose, but the amount that you lead. We all want to be influencers these days, but do you want to be a world changer for Jesus? Do we want to be an, a significant witness that all of a sudden we take significant leadership upon our shoulders and say, you know what? I want to be used for the glory of God. I want prisoners to receive Jesus. I, I, I want to go to all of our missions areas. I want to start new missions fields and new ministries. And I, I'm praying right now for all of our people who are streaming all over. And I pray you, you decide to say, you know what? I'm going to make my home a home church. I can't make the flagstaff, but I'm going to be a witness right where I'm at. I'm going to change my community. I'm going to change my city. I'm going to change my, my work environment. I'm going to, I'm going to be a witness. Why? Because you know what? When you understand how valuable you are and who made you valuable, you can't help but want to share value. Greatest leadership is determined by those who add value to other people's lives. When you learn how to add value to other people's lives, that's when you'll understand that you found your value. It's, it's very, when you're a small minded, small and secure person, it's hard to compliment somebody else. When, when you're a big person, listen, if I had a guy Victor's in the other server. If I, if, if I had Chris come up here, a mountain of a man, huge, and I'm like, Chris, how am I doing? Am I doing good working out? And you're like, dude, you're doing great, man. Look how big you are. Look how great. Why? Because he's huge. And he looks down at me and he's like, you're such a big guy. Because <laughs> it's easy to compliment when you're a big person. When you're small, you're always like, oh my gosh. And it's hard to compliment them because you feel so small. Big people become great cheerleaders. Great believers become great cheerleaders. I, I, I want to, you're, you're meant for something incredible. You're meant for something amazing. 
When you get the real value you need in you, you're going to help other people discover theirs. Will you stand with me? We're going to pray. Man, what a great day. Can we give God some praise? Yeah. I just want to pray this word over you. We're going to be dismissed, and then I I hope to see you. We got Wednesday night prayer. Uh, Of course, you heard the new summer service times. We don't have our Tuesday night service. We only have our midweek Wednesday night service, and then we're shrinking back on life groups. Why? Because we want people to rest. We do believe in a Sabbath, taking a moment to rest on your production and rest in his. And so we want our leadership, our staff, our volunteer. I want you to see this as a church. It'd be easy to just stay at four services and say, oh, we got four services. Oh, we're going to go to five. No, we need to rest. We need to be healthy because momentum isn't guaranteed. Momentum is managed. And so you, you have to continue to manage what the Lord has given you. Be good stewards. And so I want to pray with you as we go into this next week and this summer and just pray this significant word of your life that this summer you become one of the best witnesses you've ever been in your life because you first discover who you are and how incredible you are. Let me pray with you. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you right now. Come on, put your hand on your heart if you can. And, and I just want you to pray with me. Don't, don't, let, don't just listen to me pray. Pray too over your life. Lord, I thank you right now for every single person under the sound of my voice. I pray that you would instill in them a significant, Lord, direction and definition over their life. They don't need to be, Lord, wondering and worrying. Are they valuable? Do they have something to offer? Lord, let them finally see they've got all that they need. And Lord, I thank you that you gave it to them. So they'll never run out, God. Lord, never going to be half empty or mostly empty or half full or kind of full. God, their cup will run over and out of them will come a well of life. God, Lord, that never runs empty. I thank you, Lord, that you are going to create a powerful witness in this place. You're going to create some significant conversations in this place with wonderful people. And we're going to see many come to know Jesus. We're going to change Flagstaff and Northern Arizona and Williams and Winslow. God, we're going to reach to Eager. We're going to reach, Lord, to all over, God, Lord. And I thank you, God, Lord, that you are going to do a mighty and beautiful and wonderful work, God, Lord, from those who know who you are and know who they are in you. And, Lord, we thank you, God that you are establishing this word in our mind and our heart. And right now, if there's anybody, I, I want to give you this opportunity. I know i got to close, but with every head bowed and every eye closed, number one, if somebody needs to let down that bucket, I don't want anybody looking around. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now. And I'm going to pray with you. Hands going up all over this place. It's time to let down that bucket. That's good. That's good. Just knowing it. it that's a huge part. So I'm going to let down that bucket today. And so I want to pray with you. Lord, in Jesus' name, every hand that's raised, every heart that's open, God, they have been living a bucket-to-bucket life because life taught them it comes with pain and failure and hurt. And everybody stabs them in the back and everybody takes and they got to do what they got to do just to survive. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray those buckets can come down and let the well spring of life, the water, the living water come into their mind and their heart and encourage them. We don't need to be affirmation addicts. Lord, we just need to be sons and daughters of the Most High, and we'll always be loved and affirmed and provided for. And I thank you, Lord, that the bucket is coming down. Just speak it over yourself. The bucket's coming down, and I'm going to live a totally different life, and I'm going to live a satisfied life, the blessed life that God has for me. In Jesus' name, everybody who is praying and just receiving from God today, shout a good amen, and let's give God some praise. Let's just thank the Lord for a minute. Come on, let's give him a big praise. Hallelujah. Man, it's easy to pastor a great church. Y'all are phenomenal. You just don't know how great you are. Some of you see a seven or a five or a four on your forehead. I'm telling you, I only see champions, tens. We can change the world. We can change all of Flagstaff right here with this crowd today every single person. Y'all are phenomenal. You just got to believe it. You got to step out of here today and say, man, whose life am I going to change today? We're so glad you joined us today. If you made a spiritual decision, whether that was dedicating your life to Christ or rededicating your life to Christ, send us an email at info at rearbridge.church and let us know you made that spiritual decision. Also, if you're joining our Bridge Church family online for the first time, we have a very special gift for you. Send us an email at info at 
to share some information on where we can send you that gift. We're so glad you joined us today, and we can't wait to see you soon. Be sure to stay connected, because we're so much better. Together. Together.